and I bring you the warm felicitations of President Muhammad Buhari, President Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And on his behalf, I congratulate you all, participants of the senior course, for your excellent performance and your preferment today to the and your preferment today to the very special privilege of member of the National Institute, MNI. And to those who in addition got their French certificates, I say, uh, Félicitations à vous tous, bien fait. For those, uh, for those who do not speak French here, uh, all I was saying was that Anyone who doesn't speak French has a problem. <laughs> As congratulations to you all and well done. I also congratulate family and friends and especially spouses of participants on this joyful occasion. It will be remiss of me, of course, if I fail to congratulate you all on your very well-researched and thought-provoking presentation to Mr. President on Thursday on getting things done. Strategies for policy and program implementation in Nigeria. Congratulations and well done. You are graduating at probably the most consequential period in Nigeria's history. A time of immense challenges and even more enormous opportunities. Permit me therefore to spend a few minutes to broadly sweep through some of the challenges we have faced and how we have surmounted or are surmounting them. The point of the exercise being to exercise your minds as members of Nigeria's foremost think tank as we interrogate how optimally leadership or other actors responded and perhaps what more needs to be done. I'll mention in particular four areas. The first is the public health response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the future of our public health services. The second is the response to the economic downturn in the aftermath of the pandemic and the issue of continuous growth. The third is what I've described as unicorns and the future of youth employment in Nigeria. And the fourth is the new national development plan. Let me begin very quickly with how we responded to the onslaught of the COVID-19 pandemic, the most devastating global health crisis in living memory. Shortly after the COVID-19 patient, the first COVID-19 patient in sub-Saharan Africa was identified in Nigeria. A sample of the virus was sent to the Africa Center of Excellence for Genomic Studies of Infectious Diseases at Ede in Oshun State. There, a team led by Professor Kristen Happy analyzed the sample and was able within 48 hours to share with the global science community the very first genome sequence of the severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, from Africa. Most people did not even know that we had that capacity or that the facility existed or that it had even been recognized internationally. Second, we were able to scale up testing and case management, our capacity to do so quickly activating 120 laboratories nationwide from just five before the pandemic, and most of them public laboratories. One reason why we've been able to manage this pandemic better than many expected, and even better than wealthier and more developed economies, is the structure of our public health, uh, of our public health services. Our public health services are experienced and robust. The, out, the Ebola outbreak in 2014 and our ongoing battles with Lassa fever and the successes we've had with polio eradication helped us to tighten our epidemic contingency plans, to strengthen our emergency coordination and surveillance capacities. It's also ensured that we invested in public health facilities. One of the key lessons that we learned from our response to the Ebola outbreak was the need to build systems, quote, in peacetime that can then be used during outbreaks. Our National Center for Disease Control, which was founded in 2011, but in 2018, 
Mr. President accented to its becoming an independent agency. As it turned out, the NCDC's independence was important in its being able to function unrestrained by bureaucracy when the pandemic struck. With the NCDC's National Health Reference uh, Laboratory in Gadua and Abuja, its state-of-the-art equipment and well-trained scientists is evident that the NCDC is one of the best prepared and best resourced of its kind, at least in Africa. The President also directed the setting up of our locally and now internationally acclaimed presidential task force on COVID-19, an interministerial interagency team led by the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, reporting directly to Mr. President, which coordinated the national response set the rules, briefed the nation daily for months. The task force swiftly issued and enforced COVID protocols for travel and general movement. Many of those protocols were later copied by other countries. When the first doses of the vaccines came, the task force quickly developed the protocols and the public health system that was already used for mass, uh, mass vaccinations deployed across the country in every nook and cranny of Nigeria so that the first eligible vaccine candidates received their vaccinations seamlessly. So going forward, what do we need to do? I think flowing from the reality that every nation is on her own in a global pandemic and even how vaccine-rich nations at some point banned exports in order to meet their local needs it's clear that we must take our own destiny in our hands. But what do we have already? What is it that we have already? Last December, the National Institute of Medical Research launched a new set of COVID-19 test kits that can produce results in 57 minutes. The new kit, the new kit was designed by Joseph Shaibu, a molecular biologist at the, M, at the uh, National Institute for Medical Research. By the end of the year, the Africa Center of Excellence in Osho State will inaugurate the biggest genomic center in Africa. Earlier this year, <laughs> earlier this year, that center was selected by the Broad Institute of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and the Harvard University to be part of a prestigious scientific coalition that will help set up an early warning system to prevent and respond to future outbreaks and pandemics anywhere in the world. In September 2020, the World Health Organization named the Genomic Center one of two, the other is in South Africa, specialized continental reference sequencing research laboratories for emerging pathogens. Professor Happy and his team have also produced a groundbreaking rapid test certified by the Food and Drugs Administration of the US government. And it costs around $3, much less than the average PCR test will cost. In addition, the test doesn't even require the highly equipped laboratories that tend to be very expensive. But more remarkably, they are developing a Nigerian anti-COVID vaccine. The Africa Center, the Africa Center of Excellence for Neglected Tropical Diseases and Forensic Biotechnology, led by Professor Y.K. Ibrahim, has also developed capacity capable of doing mass testing as good as any anywhere in the world. During the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, between 2014 and uh, 2016, the Africa Center was instrumental to containing the epidemic in the sub-region by the development of a 15-minute rapid diagnostic test. This method was approved by the World Health Organization, the Food and Drugs Administration, the FDA of the US government. The same center developed a 10-minute rapid diagnostic test for Lassa fever, setting in motion the possible development of the next vaccine for that disease. And Nigeria is currently in, in talks with the, uh, with the World Bank, uh, its private lending arm, to raise $30 million to finance a vaccine plant. BioVaccines Limited, with 49% owned by the Nigerian government, and the balance held by May and Baker Nigeria PLC, plans to begin construction of the plant in the first quarter of next year. 
The plant will initially fill and finish, which means importing raw materials for the vaccines and then packaging it for distribution. Full manufacturing is expected to follow. So these are some of the developments and some of what we've been able to do so far. Now, what about our response to the economic downturn in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic? The damage done to the economy by COVID-19 and the global lockdowns was great. GDP contracted, as I'm sure we know, by minus 6.10%, percent by 0.10 percent during the second quarter of 2020. All price at one point was about $10 below production cost. A barrel then finally settled at about $45 a barrel during the second quarter of 2020. Unemployment went up to 33.3% in the fourth quarter of 2020. The transportation sector declined by 49%. Hospitality fell by 40%. Education by 24%. Real estate by 22%. Trade declined by 17%. And construction by 40%. So we were in a terrible economic situation. In response, the president took two swift steps. One was to set up an interministerial committee headed by the Minister of Finance to quickly work out the implications of and the immediate mitigation of the economic shocks that were headed uh, for. The second was that the president directed me and a team of ministers and interagency heads to draw up a 12-month economic emergency plan, which became known as the Economic Sustainability Plan. We were clear that the only way of avoiding an economic disaster that could last for years was for government to essentially put forward a major fiscal stimulus plan. Such a plan must have clear objectives of saving jobs, creating new ones, supporting businesses that may close down, and employees that may not be paid during the lockdowns and of course healthcare support to, re to reduce the COVID-19 based uh, caseload. So we promptly put together a stimulus plan in the order of 2.3 trillion Naira. We took quick fiscal measures, including the grant of an additional moratorium of one year on CBN intervention facilities, a reduction in interest rates on intervention facilities from 9% to 5%, a grant of regulatory forbearance to banks so that borrowers could have some breathing space, including restructuring of outstanding debts. And of course, there were several disbursements that the CBN made uh, to 3.9 million smallholder farmers under the Anchor Borrowers Program, uh, about uh, 134 billion to 38,000 beneficiaries under the AGS IMS scheme, and also to about 672,000 beneficiaries. And then generally, it's a disbursement of about 103 billion to 110 healthcare projects in all the states of the Federation. We also instituted an MSME survival fund. This was designed to keep as many junior private sector workers as possible employed and paid. 1.1 million people benefited from the fund. Another important part of the ESP was the Agreek for Food and Jobs Plan to provide jobs and food. Through a mass agriculture scheme, 6.39 million farmers were enumerated under the program, and they were geotagged to their land. So today, we have geotagged to their land a minimum of 6.3 million Nigerian farmers. Three, th 320 hectares of land, of course, has been cleared across eight states, and that continues at about 40 hectares per state. And 100, 471 billion has been allocated to farmers across 14 value, crop value chains, including beef production, aquaculture, poultry farming, etc. The president also approved the fertilizer subsidy uh, program. The subsidy payment is evidence based and tied to the farmer enumeration process. The subsidy is to be paid directly to each farmer's BVN verified account. A subsidy of 5.1 billion was, has been paid so far to over 1.1 million farmers. The third component of the ESP, or the Economic Sustainability Plan, is a social housing program, 300,000 uh, 300, homes to be built across the country. The states are to provide the land free, and we've got already 24 states have provided land. And this is 
uh, to create and of course will create thousands of jobs and boost the local building materials industry. The design is to build two bedroom, home, two bedroom homes costing not more than two million naira each so that a person earning a minimum wage can pay back the mortgage in 15 years. Bono State, working with the Family Homes Fund, which, is to, which implements the project, has built 8,000 of those units already. Then we have the solar electrification program, which is called Solar Power Niger, with 5 million new solar connections to reach 25 million people. It's also designed to create several jobs and develop a local solar industry including the assembly and manufacturing of components of solar home systems and off-grid solutions. And all of these, I mean, of course, there's far more detail, but I'm abbreviating as much as possible. Now I come to the, uh, to the third point, which is the unicorns and the future of youth employment. In the past few years, we have seen Nigerian startups owned by young men and women. These are technology startups mainly, grow from scratch to billion dollar businesses. As of 2021, more than six of such companies have been named unicorns. A unicorn is a company that is worth over a billion dollars, not a billion naira, a billion dollars. Six of these companies started between 2016 and now in the middle of two recessions and the global health crisis. The companies are Opay, Paystack, Flutterwave, Andela, Piggyvest, and Jumia in the e-commerce sector. Paystack and Flutterwave were co-founded in 2016 by two graduates of Babcock University in their 20s. Paystack is a payment processing company, and I'm sure many have heard that it was eventually bought over by Stripe, the, the uh, American multinational. It's now estimated to be worth a billion dollars. Flutterwave, also a payment processing company, founded also in 2016, is now worth nearly $3 billion, and both companies employ hundreds of young men and women. Flutterwave was also founded by two young Nigerians in their 20s. There's also Piggy Vest, founded by a young Nigerian lady and her colleagues, ex-students of Covenant University in Lagos. Piggy Vest is a wealth management platform that at the end of 2019 had helped more than a million users to save about $80 million. And of course, you have InterSwitch, you have Jumia, and several of these other icons, of unicorns. Now, what is responsible for the successes of these companies? Providence and good policies. Providence because COVID-19 was a boom period for online payment systems. Policy because Mr. President approved the establishment of a technology and creativity advisory group that helped to formulate new banking policies to accommodate new technology-enabled payment systems, such that these tech companies could process payments without being full-scale banks. Of course, if they had to be full-scale banks, they'd have to have 25 billion as capital before starting. But because of the new policies that the president approved, they were then able, through the CBM, the CBM was then able to issue fresh licenses for payment processing. The federal government and, and the federal government since then has established a 75 billion national youth investment fund. This provides financial support for small businesses in any field. The central bank has also established a creative sector fund. This is for young people in entertainment and te technology. There's also a new program called Investing in Digital and Creative Enterprises, an over $600 million program which we're working on with the AFDB that will support young uh, tech and creative sector entrepreneurs through the provision of finance, skills development, and infrastructure. Earlier in the year, the federal government partnered with the UNDP and the private sector to, to start a program called the Jubilee Fellows Internship Program. So for the next five years, every year, beginning this year, every, after youth service, 20,000 young people will be given internship opportunities in private sector companies and public agencies. They will be paid, they'll be paid in full for the entire period of the internship. The idea is that they will learn uh, relevant career and life skills, which will enable them transition seamlessly into professional business or public sector careers. 
while also earning, as I said, a good pay. These snapshots that I've given uh, of the various activities, economic, healthcare, etc., are to show us that there are possibilities and that we are not facing an uncertain future without any tools at our disposal. However, we know that if we are to inaugurate a new age of accelerated growth, then we must adopt a strategic direction and policy orientation. Today, two quarters consecutively, we've recorded growth of 5% and 4.3%. And there is no question at all that the growth trajectory will continue to be good. This is precisely what the federal government uh, seeks to do, especially through our new National Development Plan, 2021 to 2025, which was recently approved by the Federal Executive Council. So in terms of strategic direction, the cornerstone of the, tragedy, of, the, of the strategy is boosting productivity by focusing on value addition as a guiding principle for all sectors, especially agriculture, manufacturing, solid minerals, digital services, tourism, hospitality, entertainment, etc. In agriculture, for example, just as we seek to increase production of rice, as one example, we are paying equal attention to other parts of the value chain, such as storage, transportation, processing, and marketing. Because everyone recognizes today that it is value-added services that creates jobs and opportunities, not just the, uh, not just the produ uh, production of crops. Similarly, in the mining sector, we recognize that exploitation and extraction will not create the jobs that we need. Our aim is to focus, therefore, on resource beneficiation. Local industries will be created, thereby creating wealth along the mineral value chain. There are a number of cardinal principles of, of the strategic direction that is enshrined in the National Development Plan, but just one or two of them. The first is the centrality of job creation. All programs and policies are to be viewed from the lens of the number of jobs, direct and indirect, that they create. Secondly is the loosening of restrictions on trade and generalized restrictions on trade. We believe that generalized restrictions on trade are counterproductive, especially when they impede the ability of local industries to procure inputs. Our focus instead will be on allowing import of goods to which value can then be added before domestic consumption or, export or exportation. For example, look at cotton, importing cotton for garment making. Now, there are those who will argue that we should ensure that we grow all our cotton. But the issue really is that where the jobs are created is on value addition. Bangladesh, for example, only grows 2% of its annual cotton requirement and is the largest garment exporter in the world. It, it, it imported recently, in the, in, in the last year, $11.8 billion of textiles and apparels, while it exported $31 billion of garments in 2019, much higher than we exported in oil. Thirdly, the main fiscal challenge facing Nigeria is inadequate revenues, especially in the face of lower oil revenues and your research pointed that out also yesterday. It's therefore essential to improve tax administration, vigorously collect, uh, collection of revenues due to the federal government from all its ministries, departments, and agencies, and bring all high-earning agencies into the federal budget. Yesterday, during the, uh, on Thursday, I believe, during the discussions that we had on your presentation, I made the point that in Nigeria, we have about 142 people, individuals, who pay self-assessed tax of more than 10 million naira. Only 142 who pay self-assessed tax of more than 10 million naira. I'm not talking about companies, I'm talking about individuals. 90% of them are from Lagos State. 90%. So in this whole country, with people who have Rolls Royces, have big cars, have all sorts, only that tiny fraction pay 10 million in assessed taxes. Everybody else claims to earn never enough to be able to pay that kind of money. 
So we need to be more aggressive about tax collection, especially tax collection from those who certainly have the resources. Concurrently, we must lower customs duties and tariffs on raw materials and intermediate goods used in manufacturing while giving reciprocal non-tariff based support like procurement subsidies and tax breaks to priority sectors. Fourthly, we must create a conducive environment for businesses to thrive. We need to eliminate red tape, extortion and harassment of small businesses which increase their costs. So let me just end by reminding our new MNIs that every MNI belongs to an elite club of thought leaders of Nigeria. You are in the front lines of our efforts to build a better future for our country. You must be the first promoters of Nigeria's unity. The seminal policy work that you produced here, which you submitted to Mr. President, shows clearly what can be done where the best Nigerian minds, regardless of ethnicity or religion, work together for the good of our nation and its peoples. And I think that we demonstrate here every year with the graduates of this college, the, the members of the National Institute, that it is possible for our country to be united, for people to work together for the common good of our people and our nation. So again, let me congratulate you and wish you all the very best in the years to come. God bless you.